Hello and welcome back to another episode of From Prison to the Streets. I'm Eric. I did 11 years in prison and I talk about prison stuff. Today I'm doing a Q&A. I really like this sort of content, so be sure to like and subscribe if you want to see more content like this. Big shout out to my Patreon patrons, Kenneth Iman and Brian Kitchens. With that, let's get into the video. Roger Bowman, 2718, asked, As an ex-felon, can I have a crossbow or bow for hunting? Yes, I can. I forgot to mention it in my recent video about gun laws and stuff like that. But yeah, I can have a crossbow or a bow. You know, some of these laws are a little bit, you know, gray area, I guess I would I would say. Because uh, if you're on parole, you can't have anything that shoots a projectile, at least not in the state of Kansas. So you can't even own a slingshot. But once you're off parole, you actually can own something like a crossbow and a bow. I'm not really good at bow hunting, though. I've never taken an animal with a bow, so I don't know. Maybe I'll give that a try at some point in the future. But thank you for the question. And Roger also left me another question. He asked, why would one group give an okay to hit one of their own? I thought gangs were a brotherhood. Why allow a hit on your own group? And he was asking this in reference to the recent video that I did on um, pulling off a hit without a green light, talking about gang dynamics and prison politics. Well, there's several reasons why someone would allow a hit on someone in their own group. And it's mostly because someone either was in violation of some bylaws by their behavior, or maybe they were against the unspoken rules in prison, you know, you're supposed to pay your debts, you're supposed to mind your own business, things like that. And, you know, if you're in, in violation of any of those things, you can catch what's called a violation, which is essentially a beating from your fellow gang members. So that would be some reasons. It could also be because it's a personal beef just between two people and they don't want to get the groups involved. So you, you know, allow people to have a one on one or something like that. But those are some reasons, you know, and there's other reasons, you know, you might find out that someone in your group may be told in the past or something like that. That actually happens. Guys will get patched in or initiated into a gang and then later on. Some paperwork will turn up showing that a guy was a rat. And usually in a situation like that, it's not even the other person who's going to be doing a hit. It's going to be someone from, you know, your own group taking out another member of your own group because, you know, gangs tend to police themselves and they don't like rats. And, you know, it reflects badly on the organization. They're not going to want someone wearing their patch who has a snitch jacket, so they're going to take them out. You know, they're going to smash them. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you for the question very much. And we're going to move on to the next one. Infinite Canadian asks, why would people try to pick on me in the comments? He said, I like your content. I am anti-crime, but at the same time, I realize that both convicts and ex-convicts are human beings. Hope my comments are never derogatory. And you know what? I never think they are ever derogatory. I always appreciate seeing you down in the comments. You've been watching the channel for a long time, and I really appreciate you watching my content. As far as why people would try to pick on me in the comments, it's just social media. You know, people chase clout by picking on people, or they just like to be trolls. There are a lot of people who are just miserable and they want to make other people miserable. And I get a lot of really hateful comments, but I usually just ignore them because I don't see the point in giving those sorts of people my time. I would rather give someone like you, someone who's been in my comments and giving positive feedback or constructive feedback or something like that. I would rather give someone like that my time than an internet troll. However, in this case, the guy said something and I saw an opportunity to educate my viewers a little bit because there are a lot of misconceptions about prison and I want to dispel some of those and, and give the real story and the real, you know, behind the scenes experience, if you will. But for the most part, I don't really care about the, the hateful comments. Sometimes I will actually roast someone for a minute and then I'll just block them for the, from the channel, you know. You know, when it comes to 
to internet trolls and hateful comments, you know, don't repeat it, just delete it. That's that's my motto most of the time. But this situation, I, I felt like I had an opportunity to educate. So I did. But thank you for the question. And thank you for watching and being a part of the channel. Stephen Cresswell asked if I had any music online. Yes, I do. And you said you're a metalhead, too. That's cool, man. I love metal and I have a lot of music online. You can find it on Spotify, on Deezer, Pandora, Amazon, YouTube Music, all sorts of places, Apple Music, basically any place where you can get your music, my music is there. Although I will warn you, my first two albums had horrible production quality. I was working on basically a five-year-old laptop and a pretty cheap mic, and... Uh, you know, I didn't really have a recording space or anything like that. And my first album, which was Alternative Religion, it was all recorded in Audacity on an old laptop. And I was homeless at the time, so I was recording in my Camaro and in hotel parking lots and stuff like that. And for my second album, I actually used a gaming headset because that's the only mic that I had. And so that was recorded on a gaming headset. It's pretty pretty brutal when it comes to the production quality it, it wasn't there so if you go and listen to my music I've, i gotta warn you i'm gonna redo those two albums at some point in the future i haven't released my third album yet i'm still working on it but i'm getting to it i have to go back and remix remaster re-record everything because i didn't really know what i was doing i have a lot of experience playing but not a lot of experience recording we didn't have recording equipment in prison so all of our stuff was performed live but, you know, feel free to check it out. I'll leave links down in the description if you want to go, you know, check out my stuff. I really appreciate it. With that, I'm going to move on to the next one. But thank you very much for your for your comment and your question and checking out the channel and seeing what we have going on. For this next question, I'm actually going to have to look at my phone because for whatever reason, this this comment hasn't been popping up in my YouTube studio or even on the video on the desktop not sure what the deal is. I don't know if it was flagged or what. I can't find it in my flagged comments, but whatever. Um, so I'm just going to use my phone. And this is a lengthy comment full of questions, which I don't really mind. Matter of fact, I love hearing from you guys. So I, I believe it or not, prefer long comments. But uh, I'm not going to read through the whole comment because I don't want to make this video a whole bunch longer than it has to be, but I will pick out the questions and answer them. And this is from Beach Girl 6305 You're always leaving me great comments and questions. I appreciate you watching the channel. And you said, it took a bit for me to picture you even fighting in prison. I know you kind of have to, but you're very calm on these. I'm not into fighting, but what you said makes sense. Go handle it and it's done. Can you let it go after that? Well, it kind of depends on the situation and context. I believe what I said in that video or what I was talking about in that video, maybe I need to go back and rewatch it, but I think I said something to the effect of, you know, I'm not always opposed to violence or fighting. You know, if, if two guys want to get into a fight and then shake hands, let it be done, whatever, it is what it is, you know, let them go handle their business and then shake hands afterwards. It's all good. It's done with. That works on the streets a lot. And sometimes in prison, it doesn't work that way, especially with guys who have a lot of time because prison is a very closed environment. You can't really get away from people. And if you both have a decade or, or more to do, sometimes guys don't want to be walking around on the same compound because you're going to eat in the same place, you're going to go to the church in the same place, you're going to go to the library in the same place, gym, etc. You're going to see each other a lot. And if you have that tension hanging over your head, you can never really be comfortable, which I don't think you should really ever be comfortable in prison anyway. But some guys don't want that tension. So instead of just throwing hands and letting it be done, they'll actually get a pipe or a metal bar or something, a knife, a lock, whatever. And they'll, you know, take the guy off the compound. That basically means hurting him so bad they got to put him in the infirmary and then ship him to a different prison. The guy who carries out the assault, he goes to Supermax for a couple of years. 
but he comes out and he's no longer going to be on the compound with the guy that he had issues with so he can get on with his time. So sometimes, yeah, it's cool to throw hands, let it be done, move on. But in prison, it doesn't always work like that. Although sometimes it does. Sometimes guys will just fight and then shake hands afterwards. And I've even seen people fight and then become really good friends afterwards because they've won each other's respect. Now, you also said, I'm guessing you want to keep your family private just in case. Well, you show them sometimes on here. And yeah, I kind of do want to keep my family private mostly because they're not old enough. My kids aren't really old enough to understand what social media is or give their consent, you know, so I haven't really featured them on the channel a lot. My daughter Inga is in my music video, I'll Stay By Your Side. My wife is also in that video. And my son is in a video that I have on TikTok with my Bronco, but, you know, I don't really have my family on here a lot. I figure when they're old enough to understand what social media is and stuff, they can make that choice. However, for tonight, since I got my buddy here with me, um, I guess I'll make an exception this one time and let you all say hi. Give me just a second. Ready? Oh. Hi. <laughs> you going to wave? That's my son. He's my buddy. He's sometimes a handful and a half, but that's my guy. And you also asked me what it was like getting all those letters, mostly fan mail. Was it mostly fan mail? And you asked if I stayed in touch with my fans and if it's disrespectful to call them that and if it bothers me that some people think of me as a hero. I really enjoyed getting the mail. I really appreciate people taking time out of their lives to write me. I don't know if it's disrespectful or not to call those people fans. I would prefer to call them friends or pen pals or something like that, but not necessarily fans. But it feels good to be remembered by someone. A lot of people in prison don't get any mail whatsoever. And, you know, I had people who were interested in my life and wanted to hear about me and wanted to share their time with me. And that meant a lot to me. And it still means a lot to me. And I do keep in touch with some of those people. Not as many as I wish I did. And I don't hear from them as often as I would like to. But I still appreciate those people really. You know, they're, they're fantastic folks. And as far as being thought of as a hero, I don't know. I don't really know how I feel about that. I will say that sometimes it worked out to my benefit because when I entered the prison system, a lot of people already knew about my case and they treated me well because of it. I was already respected when I hit the compound to a degree. And so people treated me better. You know, people respected me a little bit more and they helped me out. They helped me learn the ropes of prison. But thank you very much for the questions. I hope I answered them satisfactorily. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you. All right, this next one is another question from Infinite Canadian. If you guys are wondering, I'm just going down my comments thing in my, in my studio page. And I'm just taking them in order. This is from Infinite Canadian. And... He asks, what kind of musical instruments do you own? Do you like vacuum tubes? Well, I'll answer the question about vacuum tubes first. I'm assuming you're talking about tube amps. And yeah, I love tube amplifiers. They have a very unique sound. I don't know if it's an old school way of thinking about it, but I love the sound of tube amps. And I haven't found a digital amp that sounds exactly like a tube amp yet. And... The amp that we had in El Dorado was a crate Blue Voodoo 120, and it was the whole half stack, cab, everything, and I loved it. And I would love to be able to afford another BV120. It's an awesome amp. If you have a chance to go on Reverb or something and check that out, or even on YouTube and just see how a, a crate BV120 sounds, they're awesome. And I want one. Um, as far as other musical instruments that I own, I have two saxophones. I have an alto and a tenor sax. Both of those were instruments that I played in high school. I have several harmonicas. I have a violin. Uh, I have a bass. 
I have an acoustic guitar. My bass is a Schecter Griffin 4. My acoustic guitar is a Yamaha. I want to say it's an F335. I have a Memphis Strat copy. And I have a Jackson 7 string, which I haven't shown on the channel yet. Maybe I'll do a video showing my guitars again. I haven't done that for a little bit, and my collection has grown. And I also have a, uh, a Rhodes Jackson Fly and V, you know, a Rhodes V. Uh, that's a pretty cool guitar. What else do I have? Oh, yeah, I have a Starcaster and a Jackson Dinky Rev pretty cool guitars and I'm trying to get my hands on a good keyboard and maybe an electronic drum set. I'm I think I'm going to go with electronic drums just because I can do a little bit as far as programming the sound and getting it dialed in. Right now this is my recording space and the acoustics aren't great. So and with an electronic kit I can, you know, plug headphones into it and do my thing, but I play all the instruments that I own except for the harmonicas. Dirty Pat Walsh was helping me out, and I kind of just, I've been slacking, you know, to be honest. And I need to get back to recording some music. But I'll get to it, you know what I mean? We'll get there. But thank you very much for the question, and we'll move on to the next one. Torgo Max asked, or commented, and asked, I hope I can get that Swedish death metal sound to come out of my PV bass someday. What kind of pedals do you use? You know, I haven't really paid attention to the sound of the bass in Scandinavian death metal, but I use a GT1B bass pedal from Boss, and I, I love Boss pedals. I don't really have any pedals for my guitar right now. I either use effects on my amp or I use it in Reason 11. But when I do get some more pedals, I will probably either get a Zoom pedal or a Boss multi-effects pedal. I've never messed with pedal boards or anything like that, but I have messed with multi-effects pedals and I really like Boss and I really like Zoom. I think they're they're great. They might be a little bit more budget friendly than some of the other, you know, pedals, but you know, most companies have low-end stuff and high-end stuff, and I've just never had the money to have high-end stuff. All my stuff is cheap, and it's probably a good thing because I beat the hell out of it. But yeah, that's what I use, and I don't know if I could give you any tips on getting a Scandinavian death metal sound out of a bass because I haven't really paid attention to what a Mono Mars bass sounds like. I just haven't paid that much attention to it. But thank you very much for the question. Thank you for watching the channel. And I hope your your bass playing is coming along. I need to put up some tutorials over on my music channel. But yeah, I appreciate you. Hey, so Eric from the future. When I was editing this video, I realized that I didn't answer this next question completely. I forgot about the other questions in this, in this comment. So here I am uh, reshooting this. So C. Muhammad 3707 said, good storytelling. Anyone from Missouri locked up with you? Was it tough on out-of-state prisoners? What are the politics in Kansas? Are there gangs in Kansas prisons? Man, you really did a good job. Well, thank you for the question. Thank you for the comment. Thank you for watching the channel. To answer your questions, yes, there were a lot of people locked up with me from Missouri. You know, Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri are right next to each other, and you can cross over to the Kansas side from Missouri pretty easily, and a lot of people do and catch cases while they're over in KCK. That happens quite a bit. But some people just come from out of state to hang out or whatever, and, and they get hemmed up. So, yeah, I, I knew a lot of people from Missouri. A good friend of mine, Joe Maddox, was from Missouri, from Kansas City, Missouri, and we did quite a bit of time together. And, you know, I don't know if you guys pay attention to some of the other people that I feature on the channel, like Harvey Seidel. He's from Missouri. We didn't do time together, but he has a really cool prison channel. And Tashunka Witko, he has a really cool channel. Both those guys are from Missouri. If you have a chance to check out their channels, please do so. But as far as the the aspect of out-of-state prisoners, it's tough on some out-of-state prisoners and not so tough on other out-of-state prisoners. Like guys from Missouri, 
usually they don't have any problems. Usually guys who have a problem when they come from out of state is when they come in trying to act like Billy Badass because they're from another state. A lot of guys think they're super tough because they come from California or the California system or from Florida or from Arizona or any number of places. But when you come into a prison system acting like you're some sort of tough guy, you're setting yourself up for failure because people will try to prove you wrong just to prove a point. And when you walk around acting like your state is better than everybody else's state or, more importantly, the state that you're serving time in, it offends people. You know, if you walk into a Kansas Max prison acting like a Kansas prison is soft, chances are someone's going to want to mess with you just because they feel disrespected by that. So yes and no. Sometimes it's hard on people from out of state. Sometimes it's not. The worst assault I ever saw in the Kansas system was actually, um, you know, on a dude who came from Florida. He got stabbed up really bad in the chow hall. As far as the politics go, the politics are kind of different. You know, it's not like California or some states where it's very racially segregated. Kansas isn't as racially segregated as most systems on the West Coast that I've heard about. You know, you'll see white guys sitting down with black guys or Hispanic guys, whatever. Race doesn't become as big of an issue when it comes to politics. Most of the politics are behind making money. And, of course, gangs. Yes, there are gangs in Kansas prisons. We have GDs, GDSDs. We have Crips, Bloods. We have Vice Lords. You know, it's more geographic. You'll have Wichita cats who stick together, Kansas City cats who stick together. You have Top City dudes that roll with Top City. And they're serious about where they come from. And it's not necessarily, you know, a Wichita dude is going to have a beef with a Kansas City dude. It's just that they tend to click up based on where they're from. That doesn't mean that a Wichita cat won't hang out with someone from Kansas City or Top City. It's just, you know, who they who they associate with. But you'll see people chopping it up wherever. And yeah, I I think that answers the the other question, are there gangs? Yeah, there's, you know, Raw Boys. There used to be a, a group that claimed to be Aryan Brotherhood, but I guess they weren't sanctioned by the actual Aryan Brotherhood, so they got shut down and had to change their name. Um, there's a bunch of white gangs. There's a bunch of Mexican gangs. There's all sorts of gangs. So, yeah, there's there's gangs and politics and all the great things that come with being in prison. I think in a future video, I'll actually do a breakdown on Kansas prison politics and how they work. But for now, I hope that answered your question. Thank you again for leaving me the comment and the question. I sure appreciate it. And now back to the, the past me. Big Tex Nick 2188. I've answered your questions before. And I've seen you down in the comments. I appreciate you. But Nick said, such a great channel, can't get enough of these prison stories, even if some are not pleasant to think about. I had another question. What about your history with the guards and officers at the prison? Were they mostly cool? Ever find any corrupt ones? Would love to hear more about that aspect. And I can actually do a full video on this. This is a really good suggestion for a topic. But I can answer you briefly here. A lot of the officers were cool. I didn't have a lot of issues with most of the officers, there were always a few around that were just assholes, not just to me, but to everybody. But for the most part, I was cool with the officers because I was respectful and I didn't give them problems. You know, I didn't give them a reason to mess with me. Officers are just like most other people. You know, if you give them a hard time, if you're a dick to them, they're going to be a dick to you. And if you're respectful to them, they'll be respectful to you. So, you know, I didn't have a lot of problems. There was one in Winfield who kind of spit on me and he called me a liar and insulted my mother. And I tried to put hands on him. I ended up fighting with, you know, like five cops or something like that. And they threw me in the hole for a long time. That's a whole thing. I got a video on the channel about it. But 
that was probably the biggest issue I ever had with an officer. There was also an officer in El Dorado that, you know, I broke a, a mop handle and threatened to stab the guy with it. And I chased him into the control center and they didn't throw me in supermax for that, but they did make me take anger management. That was also kind of a big deal. I didn't know any corrupt cops firsthand. Nothing bigger than, you know, uh, there were officers that were around that would uh, bring me food that their wife had made or something like that. And that's technically breaking the rules, but I don't think that's a huge deal. You know, sometimes they would bring me knickknacks or whatnot. Or my hustle in prison, I made jewelry and I would make jewelry and sell it to the officers. That was pretty cool, you know, but not a lot of corrupt ones. I kind of had an indirect connection with one in Ellsworth when I was running tobacco. He was bringing the tobacco in. I was aware that he was bringing it in. He was aware that I knew what he was doing, and he was aware that I was the person that tobacco was going through, but there was kind of a middleman. There was a another prisoner that he was cool with who he would bring it to. I was paying him. The prisoner was paying the officer, you know what I mean? It was kind of a um, a line of people that would, you know, anyway, he was bringing me stuff indirectly, basically. And I knew what he was doing. He was kind of a dick, but he didn't mess with me because I was, you know, selling the product that he was bringing in. That is probably the closest to me having a, a connection to a really corrupt cop. But, you know, thank you for the question. I really appreciate it. Thank you for watching. I'm going to do two more, and then I'm going to call it quits. Heinz of Facts. Heinz of Fox. I don't know the, the correct way to pronounce that since you're uh, German or you're from, a, you're from Germany, but um, I always say your name and you never correct me. So anyway, um, you asked what was my tactic to stay out of all of the prison assaults. Um, when it is said everybody is in a gang, doesn't it make this more dangerous, this life more dangerous? I'm reading from across the room and I have horrible eyesight. I mean, on one hand, you have protection. On the other hand, it is making you a target or, well, you're right. You know, yeah, you have protection, but the moment you join a gang, you're basically painting a bullseye on your back because someone is going to have beef with your gang. Now, the gang that I joined had a running beef with another organization that was over 10 years old, and I wasn't even aware of it until after I joined up. It's like, hey, you know what? That would have been nice to know that I was entering a war, you know, when, when I signed on, but whatever. So yeah, it, it does make your life more dangerous, especially in a place like Kansas, where most of the prisons here don't really require you to be a part of a gang to survive. Um, you know, I, I didn't stay out of all that. I did for most of my time. When I ended up getting involved with a gang, it was kind of to keep an eye on a childhood friend of mine who had joined up. And, you know, I was trying to, I guess be a guardian angel, but it didn't really work out very well. However, most of my time I did fly solo. And the way I was able to do that is I stayed in my cell a lot. And when I wasn't in my cell, I was either working out or I was going to a program or something like that where I was working. I stayed busy. I wasn't around a bunch of knuckleheads. I was off doing productive things with my time instead of sitting around playing cards in the day room or, you know, hanging out on the yard with knuckleheads. Even when I was in the pit, most of the time I was working out by myself. I had a few cool workout partners, but for the most part, I just did my own thing. A lot of people thought that I was stuck up, that I acted like I was better than everybody else because I didn't hang out with anybody. But for real, it was just because I was really selective over who I let in my circle of friends. I wasn't about to let someone get close to me who was going to bring a bunch of drama and bullshit into my life. I hope that answers your question. And thank you very much for your for your comment, your question, and for being a part of the channel. And we're going to move on to the next question. 
next question is from Goku versus Naruto. And uh, I, I just love your YouTube handle. It's awesome. Naruto would get smoked. I'm just saying, man. Anyway, what happened to the guy who crushed the dude's windpipe? This was left on my uh, video about prison assault stories. And I talked about a guy who got beat down by another dude. And the guy was stomping on his windpipe. And he had to be pulled out, had a, a tube put in his throat and everything. Um, and you were referring to the dude who did the stomping. I, I actually asked you about this, but then I waited to reply because I was saving it for a and a So the guy who did the stomping, I'm not exactly sure what happened to him, but usually in an event like that, if there weren't any knives or anything like that used, usually they'll just, you know, go to, uh, go to the hole and in a couple weeks they'll be right back out. So essentially nothing, you know, you go to seg for a couple of weeks and you come back, no charges or anything. Now, if he had used a weapon or something like that, then he'd be off to super max and potentially be looking at new charges. So thank you for the question. Uh, thank you for all of y'all's question. I really appreciate it. And thank you for watching. I want to say thank you again to Kenneth Iman and Brian Kitchens. I really appreciate you guys. If any of you want to support the channel, I have links to my Patreon page in the description. There's also a link to my PayPal if you want to support the channel that way. I don't really make a lot of money for, from YouTube. So, you know, I basically live off of my donations from you guys. So, you know, um, yeah, if you want to support what I do, that's how you do it. Um, with that, I hope you all are having a great day, evening, night, morning, whatever it is, wherever you are. I hope you're doing well, and I will see you in the next one. I'm Eric. This has been another episode of From Prison to the Streets. I will see you all later. Bye.